So thank you very much. And um, uh, certainly I know some of you on the, on the call, there are others I don't. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about me. I'm a medical geneticist at the University of Washington. I've been here for 45 years now. I came as a fellow in medical genetics after being at the NIH for three years as a yellow beret, as we called them in those days. Um, and it's uh, an example of how the Vietnam War um, generated a large number of people who went out to academic institutions around the country uh, after spending time training there. Um, I came to do training in medical genetics because during the time that I was at the NIH, uh, there were several people who came down from Hopkins who brought with them cells from people who had heritable cancer tissue disorders, all of which were solved during the time. Alcipitis imperfecta, EDS type 6 at that time, or uh, now typhus scoliotic EDS, um, EDS 7B, or now arthrocolasis uh, type of EDS, and um, the vascular form of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which was then known as um, EDS type 4. And it made me interested in uh, these conditions in part because I thought they were clinically interesting, but also because I thought that they, were, they represented ways to understand basic biology. And I think that the history has been that uh, that's been proved to be correct and that the number of things discovered by looking at uh, children with, uh, and adults with all of these different conditions has been um, quite rewarding. I would say that one of the things that I least expected was that we would be brought into looking at kids in whom um, the suspicion was that they had been abused uh, or that there was uh, non-accidental injury um, and be asked to try to differentiate non-accidental injury from uh, osteogenesis and defecta. Um, and it was something that uh, started um, years ago, and a number of the people that you know from the community, including uh, Bob Steiner, uh, uh, and more recently Zara uh, Zarati at uh, um, Arkansas Children's Hospital, has been very much involved in, in looking at this and trying to understand how genetic testing may be helpful in trying to resolve the issues uh, around child abuse. So, um, I am a medical geneticist here. I direct an academic diagnostic laboratory. We were one of the first uh, uh, diagnostic laboratories to begin looking at uh, children and adult with, adults with these disorders. Um, as I say here, studies uh, that I'll discuss provide partial salary support, and I wish I owned the stock in something that actually made money. And th there are now many other laboratories around the country that uh, do similar testing um, including connective tissue gene tests, matrix DNA diagnostics, which used to be at DNA uh, at Tulane, um, which actually closed. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the giants in the field like in Vitae and GenDF. Uh, the work that's done and prevention and many others, and the ones, the work that's done there are, is uh, excellent quality, and I can take all the we enjoy having you use our laboratory, but it's perhaps more expensive than some of the others. So, um, fractures are always an issue, um, and you can think about them as being accidental, which is true for many, and then others which appear to have been uh, imposed or are considered being non-accidental. Um, in the group where that's a suspicion, uh, sometimes uh, evaluation of the children um, leads to a diagnosis of osteogenesis and effect on clinical grounds, and often it, it stops at that point. In others, uh, there is no cause seen for or no determined cause that appears to be uh, contributing to a decreased bone um, strength. And in those ones, uh, when they're tested, there's a small proportion, usually about four to five percent, in which uh, diagnostic studies show <clears throat> uh, that there are mutations in genes uh, that are consistent with the diagnosis of osteogenesis imperfecta, and the, but the majority of them have uh, no abnormality. 
So in, in those kids, as all of you I think know and see more often than I do, um, that the, the presentations uh, can include fractures that can include the long bones, the ribs and the skull. Uh, long bone fractures are uh, quite typical um, and sometimes there are patterns which are really much more diagnostic of uh, intended injury like uh, fractures across all five uh, digits or all 10 digits that look like they've been slammed in a drawer. Um, uh, crush, crush fractures of ribs that are usually peculiar uh, that often can just holding on and squeezing. And then skull fractures are often thought to be not likely to be involved as part of a lie, but it's very clear that uh, skull fractures are Subdural tumors are often suggested. Do they occur in a lie? And the answer is yes, they certainly do. Uh, do they occur commonly? Probably not. Retinal hemorrhages are things that we uh, not expect in OI, but bruising is common, as common as part both of OI and as it is, uh, the clinical presentation. Excuse me, one second, Dr. Byers. Would you mind just uh, speaking more clearly into <coughs> the microphone? Thank you. Yeah, I'm not quite sure where the microphone is on. But I'll okay. keep it high and I will try to speak a little bit more loudly. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Currently common. Uh, so one of the issues that really is a, is a question is how did um, the issues around fractures and non-accidental injury become a question of OI or non-accidental injury? Um, this seems unusual because there are many different reasons that children could have uh, more fragile bones and uh, could, uh, could result in injury. In the early 1970s, it became clear that there were families of a child who had OI uh, that were undergoing extensive investigation about Child Protective Services. Some of the children's with o children with OI were removed from their homes, but we never really knew the number of families uh, that were affected in this manner. And it's also very difficult to determine uh, because at that point, testing was in its infancy. Not very many people were tested uh, and testing really became an option um, in the early 1980s. Uh, at which point it was almost all protein-based and not DNA-based, which is how it's done now. Um, to get a, an idea about the relative likelihood of fractures being the result of um, injury as opposed to OI, uh, there are about 4 million births per year. Um, it's estimated that uh, about 24 out of every 10,000 children in the zero to three age Group, which is the one that's predominantly featured in children that have non accident injury, are physically abused each year with resulting fractures, which means that there are close to 30,000 children between the ages of zero and three uh, who are physically abused each year uh, resulting in fractures. That's a fraction of the children that are thought to be abused each year. And these are ones specifically that have fractures, which is what brings these children to attention. So, if that's the case, there, there are that the close to 30,000 kids who have non-accidental injury fractures. And um, I think all of you have been aware that there are certain patterns, uh, kinds of fractures that you see that you associate much more commonly, the um, metaphyseal chip fractures, um, the posterior rib fractures, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, <clears throat> more than one fracture uh, in a hand. Um, there are probably more than 50 genetic conditions that are complicated by childhood fractures. Um, OI and hypophosphatasia are characterized by fractures in that age group and probably represent the most common ones that we see. And one of the striking things is that of the more than 50 genetic conditions characterized by childhood fractures, most have additional characteristic radiological physical findings. And so, uh, <clears throat> with at least some experience, they can be distinguished from um, um, uh, non-accidental injury. It's not easy. So how common uh, are those conditions in the population? So <clears throat> the incidence or the birth frequency of osteogenesis imperfecta is estimated to be between seven and 10 per 100,000. And hypophosphatasia is a fraction of that or about a fifth of that. 
And it's thought that these account for most of the fractures that result from a genetic predisposition, simply because these two conditions are probably the most common ones that result uh, in fractures. So let's look at how that works out. Um, <clears throat> if there are 4 million births uh, per year uh, in this uh, zero to three years uh, cohort, there would be about 12 million children. There are 28,000 or, or close to 30,000 in whom there are thought to be age uh, abuse related fractures in that group. And in that same cohort, there would be about 1,200 kids with uh, osteogenesis imperfecta. So assuming that all kids with osteogenesis imperfecta have fractures uh, during that period, um, it would mean that about 5%, that they would represent about 5% of the group um, that had what were thought to be abuse-related fractures. If there was no discrimination uh, between the group, that is, if there was nothing clinically that would allow you to um, uh, make it a clinical distinction between the two. And so what proportion of kids who have OI might be included in this group. So <clears throat> I think that you all know that distinction on clinical grounds is not trivial. And many of the features that we think of as being uh, the clear indicators of uh, the clinical diagnosis of OI may not be available or they may be confusing. For example, blue sclery may be normal until 18 months. And so it's not a necessary or necessarily a clear <clears throat> distinction between OI and children who don't have OI. Although in general, the sclerae are not the bright blue that you see with the kids with osteogenesis and protective type 1. And remember that um, when, you, when you're concerned about abuse, it's not usually in the kids that have the severe forms of OI. Uh, the surviving kids with OI type 2 really would be distinguished by the initial radiologic uh, surveys. Uh, the kids with uh, uh, OI type 3 would have striking uh, bony abnormalities, um, uh, many wormian bones, and the, and the characteristic clinical features uh, would be identified almost always by a good pediatric radiologist. Now, pediatric radiologists aren't everywhere where kids are coming to attention, and so very occasionally these kids will slip through. But <clears throat> The ability to extract those kids with OI from this group um, is important, and the failure to do so uh, has enormous consequences for the family. Um, it is also an enormous burden on, on those people who uh, practice uh, this kind of medicine. So, <clears throat> as I said, I was surprised when we first began to get um, samples from kids who had come to the emergency room and a question of whether they had OI in the context of being evaluated for abuse uh, came up. And it's important to think about how did testing change over that time? <clears throat> so in 1974, the first studies were done at the NIH that showed that type 1 collagen was altered in children with osteogenesis imperfecta. The first mutations in type 1 collagen were identified in 1984, and the first substitution of glycine in the triple helical domain which accounts for about two-thirds of the mutations in type 1 collagen genes, was identified in 1986. Uh, the first recessive uh, uh, form of OI was identified in uh, 2002, although David Salentz had suggested in his 1979 review of OI that there were certainly um, recessive forms, and he thought that OI type 3 and OI type 2 were actually recessive. And he was right at one level, but he was also not quite right in others. And the majority of kids with those phenotypes actually have dominant mutations in type 1 collagen genes. By 2007, <clears throat> uh, the search for recessive forms of OI really accelerated. And uh, this was uh, accelerated more by having next generation uh, sequencing diagnostic uh, laboratories in place. And by, 19, by 2017, almost all laboratories were using that. So protein diagnostics started in the late 1970s, early 1980s. RNA-DNA-based diagnostics, uh, getting the RNA from cells, uh, began again in the early to mid-1980s. And then next-gen sequencing became a factor in 
2011. And now almost every laboratory that does diagnostics, at least in the United States, is using next-gen uh, uh, sequencing for diagnostics uh, because <clears throat> you can do all the genes at the same time. Uh, and it's the same price, whether you do uh, not the same. It's the same cost to do one as it is to do all of them. So here's an illustration of how um, diagnostics uh, evolve. In the upper left-hand corner is a protein gel. Uh, this is a, a testing procedure that we evolved. Um, <clears throat> and it, it is an art form, uh, quite frankly. And I think those of you who have had experience in trying to uh, look at them and see what's wrong, will recognize that. And by looking at this, you have to um, uh, think about, uh, let me tell you what the diagnosis is. Um, and I'll have to go back from it. There we go. So this, this one, so this represents proteins that are secreted into the medium. And on the right-hand side of the gel are proteins that are uh, retained within the cell. So this is a control, the medium and the cell. Uh, this one, which is the one that's clear, most clearly abnormal, is from a kid with OI type 2. And you can see that the bands are mushy and there's a lot of protein retained in the cell. Uh, here, the ratio between that top band, which is type 3 collagen, and the bottom band, which, or this next band, which is the pro-alpha-1 uh, chain of type 1 collagen, is quite different than it is over here, and the bands are almost equal in intensity, and that's characteristic of OI type 1, um, <clears throat> due to haploinsufficiency for Col1A1. These other ones have very subtle changes in electrophoretic mobility, and they, in fact, have OI type 3 and OI type 4. Um, but as you can see, this is an art form. It means you have to be able to have looked at these for a long time, and they are not as, you know, this is um, art, and uh, the likelihood of error is higher than it is uh, with sequencing. So sequencing first here <clears throat> was done in hand by hand, and each one of these represents a nucleotide, and you can actually read the sequence as you come up from the bottom of the cell, of, of the gel. So you have a T and a T, and a C and a C and a T, and then a, um, a, uh, a pair of G's of here. It's hard to see the second one. Um, and um, then this is, has been uh, changed. This is actually the first uh, demonstration of a mutation in the, in the uh, glycine substitution um, that was done. And then you can see here is semi-automated uh, sequencing that gives you a very nice readout with uh, peaks. And this represents a deletion in the gene that was being studied at that point here. It's a homozygous deletion. And then next, gener next generation sequencing or massively parallel sequence analysis gives you, converts this, which is a, <clears throat> a population group, and this, which also is a population of molecules, to single molecules that are sequenced, each of which is represented by these lines that have uh, red dots on the end of them. Um, and this is now how uh, sequencing is done. So this is what the, what the material looks like when you're looking at sequence. And it means that you can identify a sequence that's in this region and you can see multiple examples of things that carry that sequence. And from that, you can then determine how many, you know, what's the frequency of the different alleles. So there are now about 20 different genes uh, that have mutations in them that account for osteogenesis and perfecta. If you look at <clears throat> uh, looking at birth, so that you have a lot of the kids with OI type 2, about 95% of the mutations occur in the type 1 and type 2 collagen genes, or the alpha 1 and alpha 2 chains of uh, type 1 collagen. And that represents these two upper ones. And all the rest in our hands represented uh, the small number of uh, mutations in other genes. This is similar to what's seen in some other laboratories. Here's the story from Montreal. And uh, what you see is that the, almost the majority of mutations occur in the type 1 collagen genes and that the other genes have a smaller number. And also important um, is that in a proportion of the ones, they found about 2% um, in well-studied children with, with clear 
uh, clinical osteogenesis in particular, that they did not find abnormalities in about 2%. So that means that that's a, a known um, risk factor in, in determining whether you can find things. So we've been involved in three studies over the years. First uh, with Bob Steiner uh, that looked at um, 55 kids who had been studied with the thought that they may have had osteogenesis imperfecta or OI. And of that group, a little over 10% had, uh, had OI that we could identify. Anita Marlow uh, looked uh, uh, 17 years later, and the numbers are similar. And then uh, Yuri Zarate at uh, um, uh, Arkansas Children's Hospital studied a set of kids from there where we did the sequencing. And again, it's you know something on the order of four to five percent of kids actually had OI in the groups that were there. In some instances, by the time sequencing or by the time uh, the protein studies have been, have been done, the protein studies would take uh, several weeks to do. The sequencing could be done in, in uh, a couple of weeks usually. The, the, for, for some of these, uh, the clinical diagnosis has been made in part because things happened like the social worker broke the, broke the femur in the course of uh, preparing the kid to take home. So <clears throat> this then becomes the evaluation. Um, these kids, um, the kids with thought to have non-accidental injury are very, very heavily screened and only a small number of kids makes it through here to come to uh, testing for uh, OI on clinical grounds. So these kids would be moved or um, identified, they hope, um, and those ones where no cause was apparent, some would be tested. We don't know how big that population is. Um, <clears throat> we are currently doing more kids in that group than we are in, in people who have identified OI. Uh, and I'm not sure what, what the reason for that is. Um, so the questions then are, what are the implications of a negative result? I mean, you know, <clears throat> um, the testing can identify children with OI, but there's not a positive test for um, non-accidental injury. There's nothing that you can do in the laboratory that says, oh yes, this is clearly in AI. So, in this uh, cohort and in trying to figure out what the implications of a negative result are, there are some assumptions. So what we'd found in the study that you just saw is that about 5% of individuals tested will have OI in this cohort. The second is that the test, the kind of testing that's now done will identify about 98% of individuals with OI. So for some, there are technical difficulties, um, <clears throat> for others, it's clear that they have mutations in genes that have not been identified, um, uh, both of which are, are possibilities. Even now, there are um, mutations being identified in genes. So if it's a negative result, either it's not OI, but it could be another genetic condition or non-genetic condition. Uh, it is OI, but testing did not identify the alteration, or it's not OI. Um, and the basic feeling is at this point that in the majority of ones where that's the case, um, where there's a negative result, it's not a lie. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's not a genetic cause, another genetic cause to have brittle bone, but it's not osteogenesis and effective. So how does that work out? And what does that mean in terms of likelihoods uh, when, you're, when you get a negative result after doing genetic testing? Well, this, is, it, it, this has been, so at the time that we were doing the protein-based studies, we would identify between 85 and 90 percent. Um, the study had been done uh, that uh, Rick Wenstrup actually did, um, was to take uh, about 200 kids in whom we were confident of the clinical diagnosis and ask how many we missed. And at that point, we missed you know, a little over 10 percent. That was seen to be a very nice whole um, and a, um, a way for defense attorneys to say, well, 10% uh, of the people that you identify and that you study don't have OI. Therefore, the likelihood is that uh, in my client, there's a 10% risk or perhaps as much as a 15% chance that uh, this child has OI, but it's not detected by testing. And in the non, you know, in, in criminal cases, that's a high level of uh, 
uncertainty and would move it out of the, um, you know, the level of likelihood that's expected for a criminal um, prosecution, it's not high enough that it would necessarily move it out of the considerations for uh, civil cases. Um, which is the first phase usually in, in what's happening. But there's something wrong with that argument. You know, and I, those of you who are geneticists and who have uh, looked at Bayesian analysis over the years can see it pretty clearly, I think. The studies that uh, are done that determine sensitivity uh, are all start with the idea that everybody in the group that's being tested uh, has osteogenesis imperfecta. But that's not the case when you're considering a child in the clinic. Um, you know, if it were 100%, if it were, if you know, your assumption is that everybody in the test group has a OI, then, and the sensitivity of the test is 98, you'd miss 20 out of 1,000. But what happens if only 50% of the children have a OI? You'd miss 10. What about if, 250 out of 1,000 or a quarter, you'd miss five. What about if it's 10% of the children in that group have OI, you'd miss two. Or if it's more like what we think, and that is perhaps as many as 5% of the kids um, uh, in that cohort that's being tested uh, would uh, have OI, then you would miss one. And that means that the the likelihood of the child who has a normal test of having OI in that cohort would be about one out of 951. That is the 950 that are in the light group here who do not have OI should all test normally. And then there's one out of that 50 that will test normally. And it's that one that would be affected. So one out of 951. You can, you can do the, um, you know, the prior probabilities and the posterior probabilities and the joint probabilities. Um, and you, you're welcome to do those at home. I think the Bayesian boxes make it much easier to see um, what those probabilities mean and why there is not a, you know, th that's a much smaller than 2% likelihood. Or if we were dealing with protein-based testing, uh, testing, you can see that the idea that there's a 15% that would be missed is not is just not right. Um, so, but the other thing that's a part of testing are these um, variants of uncertain significance. So these are sequence alterations which are not known to be causative, but are not known to be non-causative. And they are the bugaboo of uh, genetic testing. Um, um, it's uh, basically the rules are that if it's not been seen before, then it's very difficult unless it conforms, the sequence alteration conforms to a pattern that is known to be deleterious. For example, we will call every single substitution for glycine in the triple helical domain of either the pro-alpha-1 type 1 or the pro-alpha-2 uh, pro type 1 chains as causative uh, even if we haven't seen them before or they're not reported in databases because we know from our previous studies that they interfere with folding and they interfere with structure and they interfere with secretion and so they are compatible with the diagnosis. Some of the other laboratories are not quite as um, um, far out as that. So the, the usual kind of testing that we do in the case that we would see somebody who has a variant of uncertain significance is we would ask to do parental testing. Um, and that has some interesting um, implications and let me walk you through that. So this is a situation in which <clears throat> um, here is a variant of uncertain significance. Neither parent is tested at that point and so it remains a, a variant of uncertain significance. But if you now test the parents and the um, <clears throat> one parent has the same uh, sequence alteration and also has fractures and has a compatible phenotype, then you can begin to say this is likely pathogenic and so this is probably osteogenesis imperfecta and you don't have further studies. But what if the parent tested has no fractures um, but still has the variant? 
So the initial implication is that this is, can't be pathogenic. There is always the issue about um, variable expression, uh, incomplete penetrance, and things of that sort. But in essence, usually um, this will be determined to be a non-pathogenic variant. So this represents an interesting situation, and that is that if both parents have been willing to be tested, provide a result, there is, no, there is somebody that has a variant but has no fractures, it makes it seem that this is likely not it. And so these parents have volunteered to do a test which may further, which may increase the likelihood of an incrimination. And it may be interpreted as being now something that says this is not it, and therefore the, the parents are <coughs> um, uh, guilty or at least are more likely to have been involved in the fracture. Um, it would also say that under some circumstances, another gene might be involved, but for this gene, it, it uh, does this unusual thing of involving the family in um, increasing the likelihood that they will be um, <clears throat> thought to have been abusers. So that's about where we sit uh, in terms of testing. Um, the ability to exclude OI is very high, um, and it certainly can be used in that manner. Uh, the, uh, or the ability to identify OI is very good. I think now, and I think that we identify probably about 98% of kids that have OI in this sort of testing. <clears throat> the number of genes is increasing you know, a little bit each year. So almost all the ones that are identified have very, very few people that are affected with them. Uh, and um, so they don't add significantly to the burden. About um, <clears throat> more than 90% of people who have OI have fractures and type 1 collagen genes. That can be done and would be, you know, is certainly a good first start, but far and away the best thing to do really is to uh, look at all the genes and look at them at the same time. Um, it's much more efficient and it gives you a much better uh, feeling of security that you've done everything that you can. Included in this actually series is uh, looking at alkaline phosphatase, the ALPL gene, which is the cause of gene in, in hypophosphatasia. So I'm going to end there. I think uh, the person who has really been involved in this uh, is Melanie Pepin. Uh, Melanie actually founded the whole John She and Pat Ward at Baylor. Uh, we're the first laboratory-based genetic counselors. And it's uh, striking now that the majority of genetic counselors who are graduating are going into laboratories, something that was unheard of. Emily uh, actually looked at uh, the, the way in which testing is looked at uh, in the community and uh, how testing is, is. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. And uh, we are open for questions, or we can look at those, uh, some of the cases that Laura had that may be helpful.